the first person to notice it was my wife. She said, you're less of an asshole. Your um, assholedness <laughs> has gone down. Today, we'll be discussing lithium. In medicine, lithium is used as a mood stabilizer, and it's quite an old drug, having been used for over 50 years. It is primarily employed in treating bipolar disorder, a condition affecting up to 3% of the population. Bipolar disorder is characterized by periods of mania and depression, two states that could not be more opposite. Mania is characterized by, well, let me show you. I got it, the million dollar idea. Clothes for fish in your aquarium. I mean, what could go wrong? They must be so cold in that aquarium. Plus, people with aquariums must get tired of looking at them the whole time. Same colored fish every day. I mean, sweaters, hoodies, shoes, everything, everything. It's drilling, it's drilling. Stop the drilling! This wall looks so naked. You must paint it. My favorite color is green. Green, green, money, 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 money. Oh, I forgot the day trading. The day trading, the new Chinese startup is supposed to go to the moon. What do I have left in the bag? One thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. I will take out a loan and put it all in. I mean, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? It's a million dollar idea. How about I go to China? What, what time is it? The medication. I forgot to take a medication. Doesn't matter. I don't need it. I feel. I feel, never feel more alive like this. Besides mania, bipolar disorder is characterized by episodes of depression. This depression is so severe that up to twenty-five percent of patients suffering from bipolar disorder attempt suicide. There are two types of bipolar disorder, bipolar 1 and 2. In the first type, the highs and lows are more extreme, whereas in type 2, they are somewhat moderate. Interestingly, many celebrities suffer from bipolar disorder, and you might wonder if this disease is part of their creative genius. In psychiatry, lithium carbonate is used, and it's a very effective drug as a mood stabilizer. Recently, the use of lithium has decreased in favor of antipsychotics. The reason is that the dose of antipsychotics can be increased more rapidly compared to lithium, and the sedation achieved with antipsychotics is often welcomed during manic episodes. Another disadvantage of lithium is its narrow therapeutic window. This means weekly blood level testing is necessary to find the appropriate dose for the individual patient. Additionally, lithium is only available in tablet form. No IV solutions are available, making it difficult to administer to someone in a manic state who may believe they are fine or do not need it. A common reason why patients with bipolar disorder discontinue lithium is its side effects. These commonly include gastrointestinal issues such as nausea, vomiting and diarrhea affecting up to 20% of patients, especially in the early phases of a treatment with lithium. Another frequent reason for discontinuing lithium is the weight gain associated with it. After decades of using lithium, kidney function may also deteriorate and lithium also increases the risk of hypothyroidism. The common promises of lithium supplements include feeling calmer, experiencing less intense depressive, hypomanic or mixed affective symptoms, reduced impulsiveness, fewer suicidal thoughts or aggressive impulses, and a decreased consumption of alcohol. Additionally, it claims to help individuals to not get as easily upset by stressors. How much lithium does Brian take? Recently, he created his own supplements and on the label states 1 mg. I assume this means one milligram of elemental lithium, not the one bound to other molecules such as lithium carbonate or orotate. How does this one milligram compare to therapeutic doses? In bipolar disorder, doses are currently between 600 to 1200 milligrams of lithium carbonate, translating to roughly 112 to 225 milligrams of elemental lithium. This means Brian is microdosing lithium. On Brian's website, it says he takes lithium orotate, where a lithium ion is combined with an orotate molecule, then transport lithium through the cell membrane. Currently, there are no guidelines for dosing lithium orotate. In the literature, there's only one study from 1973 where patients receive 150 milligrams of lithium orotate five to six times per week. 61 patients suffer from various illnesses, including therapy-resistant headaches, migraines, depression, epilepsy, and alcohol abuse. The majority benefited from lithium orotate, showing an improvement of the symptoms. The duration of the treatment ranged from four months to two and a half years. Side effects included muscular weakness, 
lack of appetite and a general listlessness after six to eight weeks. The author of the study claims that the ingestion of lithium orotate leads to lithium levels in the brain three times higher than with lithium carbonate. So how does lithium work exactly? This is something I love about medicine. We don't know exactly, but we still use it. But on a more serious note, lithium works in different ways. Always seem to interact and thereby improve symptoms in somebody with bipolar disorder. Lithium decreases excitatory neurotransmitters, namely glutamate and dopamine, while simultaneously increasing the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. Lithium also possesses antioxidant capacities with anti-inflammatory properties as bipolar disorder is characterized by neuroinflammation. Chronic treatment with lithium also rescues BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is reduced in bipolar disorder and plays a role in neuromodulation and brain plasticity. Additionally, it inhibits enzymes such as GSK3B and IMPAs. There's interesting observational data from different countries including the US, Japan, Greece, Italy and Austria that has found a negative correlation between lithium levels in drinking water and suicide mortality. This means that in cities where drinking water contained higher amounts of lithium, the rate of suicides was lower. You may ask how lithium gets into drinking water. Actually, lithium is a naturally occurring element that enters the groundwater when groundwater interacts with lithium-containing minerals or saline water. As vegetables also come into contact with groundwater, they contain varying amounts of this metal. But back to drinking water. One study in the US showed that the mean lithium levels in drinking water samples ranged from 3.8 micrograms per liter to 46 micrograms per liter. The highest concentration seems to be in Argentina with 1000 micrograms per liter. Not only were lower rates of suicide seen in cities with higher lithium in their drinking water, but observational data from Texas also suggests a lower rate of suicide and crime in counties with lithium levels between 70 to 170 micrograms per liter. It seems as if lithium in microdoses also has a mood stabilizing effect. The amount of lithium has to be high enough though to make a difference. A Danish study examined the effect of Danish tap water containing between 0.6 to 30 micrograms per liter based on the entire Danish population of 3.7 million people over 22 years and found no association of the lithium in the tap water and lower suicide rates. The reason may be that the amount of lithium was too low. Similar studies finding negative results also had lower amounts of lithium in the tap water, for example in East England with 21 micrograms per liter. The amount of lithium in the tap water that is necessary to make an impact seems to be around 80 micrograms per liter. Another Danish study also found no link between higher levels of lithium in tap water and a lower incidence of bipolar disorder. What about lithium and cognition? Is there any research? Interestingly, there are two studies that examine lithium carbonate, meaning the lithium used as a drug in medicine, in patients with mild cognitive impairment. These patients experience a slight decline in mental capacities including memory, language, attention, reasoning, judgment and complex planning. The main difference from full-blown dementia is that these symptoms don't interfere with daily living, meaning the person is still able to live independently and take care of themselves. Let's get back to the studies. Patients were given lithium in sub-therapeutic ranges, meaning their blood was drawn and the levels were between 0.25 to 0.5 microequivalents per liter, while the other half received a placebo. Therapeutic levels for lithium usually range between 0.6 to 1.2 microequivalents per liter. This treatment continued for one year in one study and two years in the other study. The result was that patients who were on lithium experienced less decline in their cognitive abilities. There are interesting observational studies from Denmark and Texas, both showing a decrease in the incidence of Alzheimer's dementia or a reduction in Alzheimer's dementia related mortality in areas with higher levels of lithium in tap water. After presenting all this data, what are my two cents on this? Lithium in the therapy of bipolar disorder is a very effective compound that continues to be part of the gold standard for treating these patients. 
What about lithium as a supplement? To be honest, I'm not convinced. There is just a significant lack of specific research on lithium orotate, the form used as a supplement. All research in psychiatry was done on lithium carbonate. There are only a handful of old papers around 50 years old that dealt with lithium orotate and that's just not convincing to me. The main problem I have with lithium orotate is that nobody knows exactly which dose is needed, leading to problems like this. Especially with lithium, you just don't want to increase the dose like this. There's a case report of somebody ingesting 18 tablets of the lithium supplement that contained 120 milligrams. Her blood lithium levels were 0.4 microequivalents per liter, only slightly below the therapeutic level. She suffered from nausea, vomiting and a mild tremor. I'm also unsatisfied with the labels of the supplements. Let's take a look. What I miss seeing is the amount of lithium orotate and the amount of elemental lithium in it. The same applies to the studies on drinking water. These are observational studies. Are we sure that it is the lithium in the drinking water that causes these correlations? Or is it something completely different? Perhaps lower unemployment rates in cities with lower suicide rates or better access to mental health facilities? Or could it be something that we don't even have on our radar? Does lithium orotave even work the same way as lithium in tap water? I just don't believe in giving lithium to people blindly based on this data, especially if it is a compound that does have serious side effects over the long term. Interestingly, the study from Texas, which found a lower rate of Alzheimer's dementia mortality in counties with higher levels of lithium, also found that the amount of lithium doesn't matter anymore when they accounted for factors like obesity, type 2 diabetes and physical inactivity. Maybe there's a benefit for lithium in these cases, as there seems to be for mild cognitive impairment, but other interventions may offer a better bang for your buck. Maybe there's a benefit for lithium in these cases, as there seems to be for mild cognitive impairment, but other interventions may offer a better outcome. It is just that people prefer comfort over breaking a sweat on a treadmill. They want to solve everything with a small white pill. Well, it's your life and thereby your choice. It's interesting what Peter Atia, someone I admire, says about his experience with lithium. On this note, I summarize. Lithium, an interesting compound, but for now, the science is not there yet to convince me to add it to my supplement stack. Have you watched my video on ashwagandha? From what I've seen in the comments, some people swear by it.